All right. We are live on Facebook. Good evening. Rich, how you doing, man? I'm, this is, I'm doing all right, man. Sorry about that. And I think did we lose Rich. <laughs> I think we lost Rich. He'll be right back. We are back. This is Arach Media. We are back. It's been a little bit over a month. Uh, Rosmic, how you doing, man? I'm going to introduce you properly in just a moment. Uh, wanted to take a moment to welcome everybody back. It's been a little bit over a month uh, since we've last broadcast. And here is Rich coming back in. Uh, when we are on the Cotting Wine platform, Rich is coming back in. Uh, we'll give him just a second here, but I want to thank everybody. And Rich, you are you are muted. Uh, we want to thank everybody for for joining. I want to thank everyone for everyone's support over the years, and especially uh, since last fall uh, during the war, as we were broadcasting nightly and then weekly, uh, and we finally took a month, a little bit over a month off. And we are back now with our first episode since July. Rich, can you hear us? Can you I hear can. Me? Can you hear me? I don't know what happened. Yeah, we I have can. all been experiencing intermittent uh, internet issues. I've been having that at the office. And, uh, you know, it's crazy how, you know, we are so dependent on this technology now. And, and yeah. how quickly it can throw us for a loop. But thankfully, uh, I'm back. And uh, so hope I didn't miss much. But um, so. No, no. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Rich, let's, well, let's just give everybody, well, we'll let people trickle in. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight with a special guest, a uh, fellow Bay Area local doing some great work in Artsakh um, since the war. Um, he's been involved in many things prior to the war, of course, as well. We're going to hear about his background in just a moment. But Rich, let's give everybody just a quick rundown of what you and I have been up to. And we're going to welcome back Greg soon. Greg is busy working on wine harvest time for cotting wine right but greg why don't we uh, rich why don't we give everyone a little bit of a update on what you and i've been up to over the last uh, five plus Jeez. weeks or so yeah. well i've been pretty busy you know i've had uh stuff at the office i've had stuff at home i'm getting ready to launch my own business pretty soon so i've got i've got just a lot of irons in the fire and i've been pretty busy just uh sleep has been a very valued commodity let's put it that way so yeah wow wow yeah one exciting thing for me and actually the the little bit of a hiatus and break from Arach Media that we had was actually helpful for me because I started an executive MBA program at Santa Clara University and uh, it's starting to pick up quite a bit. I'm super excited about it and I'll have more to share about that as we go on, but uh, it's, it's good to be back on the show. Well, I so, know you, you, you yeah, mentioned earlier, David, that, you know, we've been broadcasting virtually nonstop since the last, since the last, the war. Uh, and I think that, that gives us a good dovetail into our guest who's been doing some exceptional work. Um, maybe you could help uh, talk a little bit about that and introduce him and, uh, and we could just take it from there. Yes, absolutely. So I have the privilege of introducing and welcoming our guest tonight, Mr. Rosmik Makaschen. Uh, he is a graduate of KZV Armenian School in San Francisco. He is a, an accomplished leader in the Armenian Youth Federation. Um, and I work, I know his parents very well, I work very closely with his parents, uh, Ara and Roxanne Makashin of uh, San Francisco, of uh, ANCA San Francisco, um, and, and so on, and the Armenian uh, Genocide Commemoration Committee, Commemorative Committee, I've worked very closely with, with your father, Rosmik, and, and I will share, it's been really, really great seeing, seeing you grow up here in the Bay Area, man, and you've Thank you. really, really just taken on some really, really amazing uh, projects. And, and you're doing some great work. And we wanted to take a moment to highlight the work you're doing in Artsakh uh, since the war. So welcome to Arach Media, Razmi. Thank you guys for everything you guys are doing. And um, I appreciate being here. Awesome, awesome. So let's get straight into it, man. Razmi, first, let's get everyone some background on you, who you are, uh, your involvement in the AYF, uh, and just uh, background with KZV and so on. Let everyone know who you are and what you're, and what, what you're all about and what you're up to, man. Yeah, yeah so uh, I was born and raised in San Francisco, California, and I went to KZV, Kruzian Zakarian, Vasburagan, Armenian school until eighth grade. And then I went to Lowell High School. And then I started my college uh, uh, at City uh, College of San Francisco. And I've been there 
since trying to finish my culinary arts degree so I can open an Armenian restaurant in the Bay Area somewhere because uh, we need it. Excellent. Awesome, man. Yes, anyway, as I'm learning that, this terrible uh, war happened and uh, I've been very um, stressed this whole time. Yeah. It's been happening. So I shifted a little bit my gears and um, I, I couldn't handle it. And I went um, to Artsakh uh, when the war ended. And uh, I did whatever I could. And I guess we will dive deeper into that. Yeah, so, you know, I'm hearing a lot in just this first opening these statements. First of all, I just, I have to say, I think it's amazing and uh, gratifying to see the generations of Armenians coming up there. We are so fortunate and privileged to, to be able to raise our children and to, uh, in this kind of an environment where we have some degree of safety and shelter for them to be able to grow up happy and healthy and then to see them contribute back to the cause uh, so thoroughly is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and so, you know, uh, I just, I wanted to just acknowledge that because I think that, and I think that many of us have felt in you know a similar way. I mean, David said it earlier, we've been broadcasting pretty much nonstop. Th this past few weeks has been, the, the one break that we've had since this whole thing began. Since um, September 27, man, since September 27. Yeah. And in fact, he and Greg were going at it every night for a while, like yeah. every night. And then it trickled to a few nights a week, then down to one night a week. And, and so, you know, uh, and, and, and the whole idea for someone like me coming on board was to help try to uh, funnel to get, help funnel together the massive information that, that, that we, that we're, that, that we're getting. Uh, and so to, to see someone like you doing that kind of work is pretty amazing. So uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the mission that you had and about what you did and about how it came about. Because obviously, obviously, you know, you you had a call to action like many of us did and you said, I'm going to go. Yeah, so during the war, actually, I was uh, thinking of going and helping however I can, but I was hearing a lot of things that say that uh, I could not come back to my family, to America. So wow. I was scared of that, you know, um, and that's its own issue. But um, after the war, I told my cousin that we need to do something because I cannot sleep at night anymore. Ugh. And um, uh, we did it. We booked our flight and um, um, we uh, got to Yerevan um december of uh 19 i believe and um we were trying to find connections anything you know that we can do you know because we had no idea what we can do to you know make any bit of difference so we got in touch with uh the only organization that was actually doing work currently in um artsakh and that was Tufankian Foundation. And um, got in touch with uh, the heads of that organization. And um, we organized a trip. And the next day we were off to Artsakh wow. um, with Tufankian organization. And um, we helped um, provide um, uh, food and uh, presents for kids in the Garmir Shuga and Herher. Uh, villages near the now border where the Turks are very close now but that trip was short because the new year was coming up and we quickly left in a few days but we were still we, we, we felt we needed to do something more and uh, after about a week of in Yerevan we were back in Yerevan we said um, we uh, we are going to find a way to go back and um, out of coincidence we were at my um, uh, aunt's house, uh, Arevik Makasjan, uh, my uncle Anto Makasjan's uh, wife, who is um, the founder of Kids of Gharapa organization, yeah. Yeah. which they played a big role in uh, what I did over there in Gharapa. So I was there for coffee and uh, Arevik, um, her sister is from Hadrut. 
uh, which is now in the Turks' hands. And they fled to Stepanagerd about 20 years ago, and they have been there ever since. So we were going to stay with them. So the next day we are on the bus on our second trip. And it was January 6th, um, wow. January 5, 6 during Christmas, wow. Armenian Christmas. And uh, um, we had to figure out more on our own what we had to do because we had no organization. We had no Tufenkia, none, nothing. So uh, we went with the Kids of Gharapa organization contact, Artur, which uh, my aunt Adevik put us in touch with. And we began to uh, provide different home appliances for families because um, that's uh, what we thought at the time was the best way to help because um, people didn't have basic needs. So we visited different families, saw what they needed and did our best to provide it for them. Right. We also went to the um, Hada village army posts and uh, provided the um, frontline uh, soldiers with uh, um, uh, bags of oranges and uh, cigarettes, coffee, um, fruits, uh, some sort of comfort and um, visited them. We gave them seven binoculars, one for each post. They didn't even have binoculars. They didn't have binoculars. Uh, no walkie talkies, they were all using their phones, which contributed to a lot of our losses during the war because the drone can see that. And uh, next we went to Marta Gert army uh, base and uh, provided them with generators, one generator and one chainsaw so they can bring it to the post so they could have power and um, so they could make fortifications and bunkers, hopefully, with that chainsaw. Also, we went to Norshen village, which during um, January times had very iffy um, electricity. And uh, we gave them three generators so they can um, distribute it and share it among the villagers so they can at least have a bit of power so they could have light, you know, at night. They didn't have light at night sometimes. And um, that was the first trip. That, and we saw a lot uh, that's amazing. of destruction. I'd like to take a second just to acknowledge yeah. something. And David, then you can take a sure. turn here. Sure, sure. Uh, as I'm listening to this, I think about what, it, what one chainsaw means for a village or for a group of people. What one generator means in terms of keeping people alive and keeping them fed and then i and i have to reflect on the times when we so flippantly go to home depot or lowe's and just walk past things and are ambivalent like eh maybe big deal so what oh that's i can find that 20 dollars cheaper and it's like what, what you know th there are people whose lives are literally dependent on a chainsaw to keep them like fortified. And I just, that's, I just, I, I, I would hope that people would take a moment to reflect on the level of privilege that we enjoy here because of yeah. stories like that are, are really make it, bring it home. Yeah. We'll say Ros Yeah. Ros uh amazing work. And thank you for sharing how it, it was expanded. It was more than just helping families with appliances and food and things, you actually gave to the soldiers and you gave to entire communities, which is amazing. Rosmi, tell us, how, how did you source these things? How did you source these I mean, these that generators? was the main goal, to make sure that the diaspora was with them. Yes. So that's why yes. I wanted to go, to be yes. with them and to make them know that we have not forgotten them. Amazing, man. Amazing. I wish, I hate to say this, but I wish more of the diaspora had that same sentiment, right? I'm not sure if you felt that way ever, but it's absolutely amazing that you did that. It's amazing that you went and did that. And I know you're gonna to continue to, and Rich and I and Greg wanna do the same. We wanted to, we wanted, I wanted to go during the war and I, I really commend you for actually going right after. What was it like going to Artsakh right 
less than a, just over a month after the ceasefire agreement, November nine. What was that like? It was uh, the saddest things of my life. One of the saddest things, um, because um, I don't want to get into all the politics of all that, but the sure. just sheer death and destruction was um, unbearable at some times. And um, it really makes you think uh, that we cannot keep going on this path. We need to sit down as a people and talk about our future because this path is, um, this is the result, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, yeah, I would echo those statements. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. think, you know, you know, like I said earlier, you know, we're all called to do some, something and, and we're, you know, thankfully you were able to go in and, and give some people some comfort. Uh, but you're right. I think there's a, there's a, you know, without getting too grandiose, there's a, there's a come to Jesus talk to the diaspora and the, and, and that everyone's going to have to have that, that that's Armenian because, uh, you know, 30 years of policies leading us to this is um, uh, is not tenable. It's not sustainable. And uh, I don't want, I don't, I don't know what the temperature in the room was like down there, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I don't, I think there's plenty of us that, that, that see the Armenian future going one of a few ways and hopefully will not go the way of being part of a Turkic, um, you know, pan-Turkic state and being some sort of county within that. Um, and I know there's rhetoric to the contrary, but the actions seem to be, um, you know, yeah. I, you know, I can't, I don't, I don't think I can say much more than that. Yeah. I agree. Rosmi, Rosmi uh, tell us what it was like. What was the experience like? getting into Artsakh and then yeah. what different what differences did you see between because you went in the winter and then you went in the summer right what differences if any did you see oh yeah with, get, with getting in and then with the people and the sentiment there what was it like yeah in the very the, big the difference years. between right after the war and um maybe three four months after the war it started getting incredibly tighter during the winter, it took half hour for us to go to the um, um, Artsakh embassy in Yerevan, pick up our visa, and um, the next day we were good to go. Uh, however, um, when I went during the summer, uh, we faced all sorts of problems. Um, I didn't face any sort of problem at all, which was surprising. Two days and I was in. No questions, no issues. Everyone else, however, either got rejected or uh, ignored, which I found very scary. I don't know if maybe that was the last time I could even go and visit Artsakh. That's the level it's become because they are doing everything now currently to not let any foreigners in and foreigners as in anyone without an Armenian passport. I have no idea how they let me in. Armenian passport. At all. Yeah, but you, you but, closed for a second there, Rosmik. You say anyone without an Ar Armenian passport, is that what you're saying? They won't let in? Or without? Anyone without an Armenian passport, it's a miracle if you get um, in. Wow. So in into Artsakh itself. Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't suppose you could comment on whether or not you saw press or not that there has been any anyway. But uh, you know, did you see any uh, anyone from an official capacity well, like that? This summer that I went, I was the um, one of the only ones with holding an American passport that was in Artsakh. Um, and there was no press at all. But during the winter, there was much more uh, flow. They were going in and out of Artsakh as they please. For some reason, people thinking that the Turks are uh, pressuring the Russians to say that the foreigners cannot come in anymore. And that is why they aren't, aren't letting any more people in. 
but that's just rumors. I don't want to um, sure. yeah, get into that true. because no one knows what's going on still. After a year, it's been after the war, no one still knows right. what has right. happened or is going on now. So when you were there, did you see a lot of Russian uh, presence and, and how was that received? Uh, you know, do you know, could, could, you, could you comment on anything about the relationship between the Russians and the native uh, Armenians who were in Artsakh? What's the temperature in the room like there? Well, there are about eight to nine checkpoints just to get into Stepanagerd. Uh, and they are um, heavily fortified checkpoints. They aren't just road roadblocks. These are um, these are like mini bases. Really, so they're they're here to stay for a while, for years. Like like con like con like con construction and turrets and stuff, or what? Like, do they build like structures? They they seem like permanent structures. Yeah. Wow. They're there now and they don't seem like they are coming back. Um, but um, manned by who? Manned by the Russian peacekeeping forces. Okay. Yeah, a new commander was just uh, installed there for the Russian peacekeepers as well. We'll get to that in the news. Right. Um, Rosmi, how did you source the appliances, the food? I mean, it's amazing, man. It's great. I mean, you don't, you don't, I don't recall hearing about a lot of organizations or individuals doing that kind of work, but you're up, you're absolutely. I think David's uh, vital. People need refrigerators. Yeah. They need generators. They need chainsaws. They need these things. How did you get them? That's amazing. We got them at discount from various stores, which our contact Artur had built beforehand from the Kids of Radapach awesome. organization. That's why I keep emphasizing that Kids of Radapach organization, my aunt, because um, it really helped a lot, those discounts. You know, we couldn't have gotten all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so mm -hmm. we got it at a regular price at regular appliance stores. They have them out there. Uh, one, for example, is called Elsa. They um, have vans and they ship it out to the family. They mm -hmm. follow us. And uh, we are happy to give it to them because we do visit them beforehand and we do see the circumstances that they are living in. And it is not good. Yeah. 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 Rich. This Rich. summer, we did a few different things than appliances, though, sure. um, which we can get into whenever. Um, sure. Go for it, man. Share it. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. Because it was different this summer, I would say, than the winter. The winter, we did more you know, toaster ovens, uh, washing machines, refrigerators, um, visiting the army posts, doing all of that kind of stuff. Um, now we shifted more uh, sustainable things uh, like our chicken project that we uh, did. We purchased around 360 chickens and we drove them out to uh, Khunsorestan, a village in the Askeran province of um, Artsakh. And there are a lot of refugees there from uh, Madaris, Hadrut, um, Agdam, Kelbajar, everywhere they are there. And um, uh, we thought chickens were good because they can uh, lay eggs. And so that could, you know, get people to, you know, get back to work. And, you know, be a little more sustainable and uh, that could help them in a better way than maybe just a, a washing machine or refrigerator. We also uh, helped wounded and uh, fallen soldiers families um, with money. And uh, we uh, gathered at the ARF office in Stepanagerd and uh, the ARF have office had a list of fallen soldiers and wounded soldiers. And uh, we thought that was a good way to help them out because, you know, they paid the ultimate sacrifice. Absolutely. They, they uh, put their lives on the line. So uh, we gave them a bit of priority. Right. Um, 
And uh, I did provide uh, three refrigerators to three different families since it was very hot this summer. This summer was record breaking in Stepanagerd for heat. And um, the food was perishing. Yeah. Um, but we quickly realized that, you know, people don't even have food to put in their fridges. So we dabbled with different methods of help. Right. Amazing. Right. Yeah, Rich, if, anything you know, if you think of just, just to drop in the water, you know, we need a lot more. Well, that, that, that brings us to the next things. I mean, obviously there's, there, we could probably spend the next hour unpacking, you know, your visit, the needs, uh, and how heartbreaking this. I can just tell you for myself, it's going to be really hard for me to gripe and, and complain about my condition of life uh, upon hearing some of this stuff. I mean, you know, every once in a while we get caught up in our own stuff. We think, oh, this is stressful. Uh, but this is not stressful com in comparison. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's good to have that kind of a reality check. Uh, so I guess that brings us to the next couple of things, which is um, now that you've spent some time there in a couple different seasons and contributing to the families and, and sort of assessing some of their needs, what do you think is going to be next for the project? Um, and then the follow-up question to that is how can not just the two of us, but all of our listeners who are listening right now and watching right now, and the people who are going to be watching, how can we support those efforts? So, so it's a two-parter. What are you going to be doing and how can we help you? So uh, Artsakh Aid Mission 1.0 and 2.0 are complete. We are definitely 100% going to do a 3.0, whether that be in the winter or the summer. It will happen because it's in my heart now and um, my heart is there now. And I really care about my homeland. And um, since we will be doing that and we will be you know, doing kind of the same sort of things, we will go there, assess the situation and do what we deem is necessary and we think we can do to help. Um, what our followers can do is um, just um, donate, obviously, that we cannot do any of this without our generous donations. And um, I appreciate every single person for uh, doing what they can um, and caring about the cause because we cannot do this without every one of you guys. That's great. Um, aside from the donations, I think sharing uh, to the Armenian community and to whichever community we are a part of, uh, whoever you know, just uh, make it known that we are under attack and we cannot sit idle anymore and we need to be active now. Right. These are the years to re-prepare and re-engage. We cannot sit idle. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, I, what, I've, what I've learned in the past about relief efforts like this is that while it may be a really um, motivating moment for people to go through their closets and get blankets and socks and the things that, that, that they have extras of, and there's something a little self-serving about purging your own stuff to get to somebody else, even, even though there's something uh, benevolent about giving. Um, the reality is, if, and maybe you can confirm this, that with so few boots on the ground, the people that are there need to be focused on direct help and acquiring products that are there and helping the local economy rather than shipping things over there and then having to sort through them once they're there. So exactly. while socks and blankets and all these things are fantastic uh, and, and necessary, maybe those things are best served to our local homeless community or local services for, you know, uh, we even some other ones that, that maybe people uh, need help. But cash donations so that we can help stimulate the local economy with purchases there might be the better option. Is that, that that's what I'm hearing, right? Uh, every, correct. Yes. Everything helps basically in the, in the big, right. we need to be collective right? in the big scheme. I'm talking big scheme of things. We need to be together with the same ideas because if everyone has 
a different approach to things, it won't get done properly. If we work together in serving our homeland and what they need collectively, if everyone does their part, we can do this. We can survive these attacks. We can thrive once again. And I will never give up hope in that because once the hope is lost, you have nothing left. You have to keep the hope. You have to keep working towards the main goal, which is a great and prosperous Armenia, which is what we all deserve. Right. No, I totally agree. So, so, so well just, said, man. So you know, well um, David, if you have if you have any other questions or anything, I what I was going to do is uh, maybe uh, show the audience uh, the Facebook and Instagram pages that you pulled together, uh, yeah. because that would be a great way for them not only to keep in touch with you or to follow you or to help uh, donate, but also to see what their efforts are contributing to. Right. Yeah. Yes, that is the best way. Facebook and Instagram. Apologize for uh, my exactly. Facebook. I think the go for it, man. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Instagram and Facebook, perfect way to stay updated, guys. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, Rich, go ahead and share it. Uh, the one thing I, I wanted to just really ask and have Rosmi share, perhaps as we start to wrap up the interview, is, oh, I, first of all, you see there, there's the Facebook page. And I will put this in the links, so no worries. Yeah. Also, uh, same with the Instagram page. Here's the Our Instagram. Second. Exactly. Thank go follow. Much. Definitely go follow. All the information is going to be there on the ways to donate. Actually, Rosmik, how can people donate? Let everybody know. How's the best yeah, way? Yeah, so I was doing Venmo. Mm -hmm. That was the main way I was able to be there and also collect money at the same time, which was key for me to yeah. help um, directly the families and soldiers in need. Yeah. I was doing Venmo, and the Venmo is on the Instagram and Facebook. I'm so sorry if that's an extra step for you guys, but... That's the perfect way to stay updated nowadays in this uh, modern world. No, I get, yeah. I get it. Yeah, we'll put it. We'll put it in the feed for sure. Uh, I got it. I found your Venmo as well, so we'll definitely put that in the feed. The Rosby, the one thing I wanted to hear, and then you could share perhaps as we as we close out the interview, is what was the sentiment of the people you were helping, man? How did they respond when you were there? a Spirkahai, a diaspora Armenian there, you're there from your heart and your effort you're on your own dime. You know, you no one supported your trip out there. You paid for this yourself. We know that and we're proud of you, man. It's amazing. What was their reaction? How did they, how were you received there? How did that go? Yeah. Well, first of all, mostly they were happy to mm -hmm. see me. As an American, traveling across the sea to be in some village in Artsakh, helping out. Because um, I saw they were surprised at that. But they were very thankful. And I saw relief on their face that, oh, thank God, you know, some something, you know, because they really have close to nothing out there in those remote villages. Um, they, their sentiment was, um, they were strong. They, 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 they still had hope. They were pissed off at the government. They, they wanted revenge. They, um, they were not going to give up. They, they, they were going to stay there. You know, they weren't, they had nowhere else to go. They were going to stay put there in their homeland. And that's what I respected most out of them. They weren't going anywhere because they didn't need to. That was their homeland. That is our homeland as well. And uh, that's why I felt so with one when I was there with them. And um, I'm just glad I had that opportunity. Well, I'm glad that you created that opportunity. It, it wouldn't have been possible without each one of those donors. And I would okay. like to say thank you again to you guys. Absolutely. Rosmik. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Thank you for sharing all the details and just your recollection of everything is amazing. Just how detailed you've, you've been and everything you've shared with us tonight. Great work. We are super proud of you. You're a friend of the show. We'd love to have you back in the future, uh, perhaps with your cousin as well. Uh, perhaps 
let's keep in touch when you're getting ready to go for 3.0. Yeah. We'll, we'll have you back and we'll talk about it. Uh, and then hopefully you can help raise, raise some money on the, in, in the process. So, yeah, we'll be in touch. Yeah. We'll be in touch. I'll be on the Instagram updated as well. 3.0 is coming guys. Thank you all for everything. You guys have a good night. Thank you. You too. Take, Take care. care. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. And keep Take it, care, keep up the good work. Thank you guys. Good night. Good night. Amazing. Amazing work, man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing and humbling. You know, I mean, I said it earlier, yeah. but it's true because, you know, you, you, you've got this young kid who is uh, and I say young kid because the older I get, everybody's younger. Right. right, uh, right, right, right. Um, yeah. But, you know, I mean, with that much fire to, to go and and to and to help uh, so it's, selflessly, it's just. It, yeah. And it's just it's really, really great to hear his passion, his fire his drive right. uh, and to see the man he's become. I've, I've seen, I've seen Rosmeek since he was a little, little child, you know, in the community, because right. I've worked so closely with his parents and seen him around KZV and around the events in the community. And so it's really amazing to see the work he's done. And I'm so grateful he shared it. Everybody that's watching, thanks for tuning in. We have a really great crowd watching live. If you're going to watch uh, on demand, thank you so much for watching. You guys go to Venmo. If you're on Venmo, um, it's at Rosmig dash Makasjan. That's at R A Z M I G dash M A K A S D J I A N on Venmo. We'll have it in the feed. It's probably already up there. Rich doing a great job with that. Thank you so much. Go there, give as much as you can to uh, to help get him ready for 3.0 Artsakh Aid Mission 3.0. Their trip coming up. Yeah, and, and, and you know the great thing about and you know i know that that some people may have a little bit of reservation about giving to an organization that they don't know much about uh but let you know let me just let me just say this about about small young organizations like this you've got a kid who has very little overhead so the money is going to go to the people and and you know we we, we have you know, we have a pretty good idea of how this child was raised and how and the family that he was that he grew up within and the community that he uh, came up in and his heart is in the right place. And, you know, we, we really believe he's doing the right work. So, Absolutely. you know, just, you know, do what you can because these people need it. Um, like I said earlier, we're all called to do something. Um, and some of us are called to broadcast as often as we can. Some people are called to to go and pick up shovels and you know, move refrigerators and some people are uh, called to whip out their checkbook. So exactly. Yeah. I guess the, the one thing to keep to just to keep in mind, it is a direct contribution to him for the purpose of buying and, and helping uh, provide aid there. It's not an organization yet. That's something we could probably talk to him uh, right as he gets ready for 3.0, but it's all, it's okay. Like he said, he did it. He go he uses Venmo so that he can have the direct cash to go do what he needed to do right then and there and it's oh, it's amazing work yeah so, it is yeah so we have a lot to talk about um you know i mean it's weird yeah. there's a lot to talk about and yet oddly enough there's not as much as you would think um we've been gone for a little over 30 days and um and the and the odd thing for me is that while the news kept trickling out um, we're still having this, there's, maybe you can help confirm or deny this, or maybe push back on me on this, but it seems to me like on one hand, we've got news percolating here and there, we've got suppression of it or it vanishes. And then we have this dual nature of what's going on with people either going to Armenia and Artsakh and acting like, like nothing's going on. And I don't understand how you could, how that, how that, how those realities are coexisting right. i just don't understand it right right there's definitely this this feeling of dual reality in the sense that you see people traveling now look you know maybe it's not fair for us to criticize people that are going there to to tour or going there to visit family or going there to enjoy themselves i have numerous friends that have been in yerevan or in other parts of the country and they've gone to enjoy themselves but i feel like it, like you said, Rich, there does feel like there's this dual reality happening because there's that. And then the border regions and Artsakh now 
you know, that's one big change since last time we were on, the provocations and acts of aggression from Azerbaijan and Turkey have continued. It's actually been six weeks. We're now, we are now six weeks since we were last on, Rich. We're back on six weeks later. And it's been continuing, the provocations and acts of aggression. And it feels like in a lot of ways, and maybe I'm wrong, but perhaps if viewers are watching, feel free to chime in on your thoughts on this. But it almost feels like it's been business as usual, despite yeah. these things happening. Yeah. And, you know, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. But uh, it's just very strange. Uh, and look, we're not going to be able to cover everything that's happened in the last six weeks, but we're going to try to get to it over time. And we're going to give you guys uh, up to date uh, as, as much as we can to what's going on right now and as quickly as, as we can a synopsis. So Right. So uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about, we've got some breaking or an important news. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Armenia. We're going to we, we have a few miscellaneous points um, and then we're going to talk about at least drop in a few of the uh, of the, the news articles that are about the topics that happened while we were uh, while we were gone um, and and also talk about um, you know an important movie screening that's going to be coming up with a former guest of ours uh, who started to get a lot of traction with the with a new film that he's put out but let's start with uh, sure. the Azeri aggression and the provocations which are continuing to this day exactly and so here's the thing and look you know rich like you know we're talking about in the prep i'm gonna take portions of articles and and literally read them to everybody and you and i will talk about it i feel like that's gonna be the best way to make sure we're we're covering what's going on on these topics right so one of the big changes or main changes at least from my point of view and rich perhaps you could share from your point of view remember when we were broadcasting weekly leading up to july 29 a lot of the provocations and acts of aggression were happening on Armenia, Armenian territory in Gehar, Gehar Kuni province, in Sunni province, near border regions, some not that close to the border, others close to the border. Things were starting to happen in Arara province as well, near the Turkish side, the, the western side. But now we're seeing literal acts of aggression, Azeri forces opening fire on civilian targets in Artsakh. And it, it's inexplicable, right? There right. is a ceasefire in place. There's Russian peacekeeping forces that are supposed to be, that are there, right? We just heard from Rosmik, right? He saw them firsthand, but yet this is still happening. Right. And it, it just boggles my mind, right? Well, I think, you know, you know without, without going too far down the rabbit hole, all I can say is this. This is part and parcel to what they've been constantly doing. This is not... Right. This is not, nothing new uh, in the sense that what they're doing, it seems to be uh, they're, they're, they're testing and they're pushing and they're trying to provoke. Um, this has been their MO for, well, for the past couple of years, which is try and provoke something. And then if Armenia responds, they can say, oh my gosh, look at what's happening. They're, they're and, you know, and, and they, and the, and the crazy thing is that, is that when, Azerbaijan or Turkey fire on us, no one says anything. But if we do anything back, all of a sudden, hey, you guys need to just chill. Well, wait a minute. How, how come those same people who are telling both sides, quote unquote, right. to ratchet it down? What you know, it, it's 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 it, this is what we mean when we say we feel like we're being gaslit on an international level. Constantly. It is it's just unbelievable. And I don't and I really don't want to play the victim here. Uh, and I don't think that our national identity should be rooted in victimhood. But, you know, if, if you if you have been subjected to systemic violence, you have to call it out for what it is. And so I'm you know, my hat's off to every Armenian who who holds it together in the, in the face of all this, because it's just it's unprecedented in the history of mankind. As far as I'm right. Concerned. Right. When we we heard Rosmik saying how he couldn't sleep, you know, Rich, you and I and Greg uh, went through that as well. Oh. You know, the. The it, level so of trauma the, that we have is just enormous. Right, right. Now, here's the thing. This case happened just two days ago. This latest act was 7.30 p.m. local time on Monday night. That would have been around 6.30 a.m. our time, I believe. And it was a house. Um, and it was, and it had a house of one of the residents of Tagavar was damaged from the shooting. Three bullets hit the wall of the house, one of them going through the window in one of the bedrooms. So again, this could have struck the civilian, right. could have killed or seriously injured somebody 
here's the thing. The Azeri positions located near the civilian areas pose a direct threat and real threat to life and other health and other basic rights of the people of Artsakh. And this is uh, Stepanyan, who is the uh, Artsakh, Geham Stepanyan, who is the human rights defender of Artsakh, who's reporting this, okay? Right. So we have to keep our eye on this. There's been other things that they've done over the last six weeks, stealing uh, shepherds, livestock, burning uh, villages, burning um, live, burning uh, crops and things on the border. Well, not only that, country. just burning, burning open land to, to, you know, and then firing at, at the response teams coming to put out the fires. So there's a lot of that, that, that that's exactly. been happening. I exactly. think the latest thing is, is that, uh, and this is the, the, the thing that we should be a little concerned about and that we should have our eyes on is the fact that, you know, Turkey and Azerbaijan are, uh, you know, conducting joint military drills um, in in Lachi. So, exactly. you know, like... Yeah, let's remind everybody where Lachin is, right? That's the main corridor between Armenia and Artsakh. And it's connecting Sunni province to Artsakh. Now, it had to be, we had to retain that passageway of the Lachin, Lachin corridor or else Artsakh was going to be cut off. The significance of these military actions, Rich, like we talked about, in here, it, they were the first to You're cutting out, David. take place in territories that came on an agreement before they were in other parts of either Turkey or Azerbaijan or in other areas that were not once part of Artsakh itself that Armenia had or Artsakh had for 30 years and prior to that for thousands of years, right? Yeah, so for sure. There well, you go. There it you is. Know, Watching. Yeah. You know, I think again, the good, you know, the good news is, is that we do have some help uh, with uh, the Russian peacekeeping force. But you know, um, again, this is this is the this is the Turks and Azeris trying to flex some dominance and see what they can get away with. Because exactly. you know, we as we all know, and this is not to be disparaging against the Russians, because they are they've they've been, you know, they are our one guarantor of 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 some modicum of safety, um, in spite of all that we've just said, right? right? So I don't mean to be disparaging to them, but you know the reality is is that in the past thirty years or so, their power has been waning, and there's been this you know deflation of Russian influence, which is why they're trying to push in many directions, uh, and they're trying to assert some here and there wherever they can. Um, you know, yeah. uh, Ukraine is one of them, and and I I think, you know, you know the Turks and Azeris are just you know, my hat's off to them for being such tremendous opportunists. You know, it's awful, yeah. it's terrible, um, but they're not stupid. You know, we we have I've heard I grew up always hearing about how stupid Turks were and how stupid Azeris were and how they're clumsy and they're guttural and their language is guttural and very you know gruff and everything. But you know what? Um, they're playing a better game of chess than we are, and that sucks. And I hate to say it, but you know. Um, you know, our guest was right. We need to we need to have a come to Jesus talk and figure out how we're going to keep this because um, yeah. we don't watch it. Uh, it it's going to get ugly real quick. Yeah, uh, I mean, again, the, these these exercises are just demonstrating another one of their provocations, right? So they're actually taking physical acts of aggression, and they're also doing uh, these these acts of uh, intimidation if you will. Uh, why don't we touch on POWs uh, now? Because there have been, there has been more continuing news of POWs and there is still confirmed more than 200 missing in action soldiers. That was confirmed also over the last six weeks, uh, Rich, since we've been off air. Right. Uh, but just happened uh, within the last couple of days as well. Uh, the, there were two Armenian prisoners of war that were returned back from Baku, uh, and I believe this happened, yeah, two days ago. So that was also, uh, must have been on Tuesday, the 7th. And now here's the thing. We got these two guys back when we returned the Azeri soldier. Cut now. That literally broke into Artsakh, Artsakh, not Azeri-occupied Artsakh and threatened the lives of two, of two children. We returned him 
and we got these two soldiers back. So yet again, completely disproportionate exchanges continue. Um, I guess I would I would ask, you know, um, and maybe this is an indictment, but um, I would ask who who's making those deals and why? Why is it so lopsided like that? Right. Um, I think I think the Asari ammo and they've said it pretty clearly. The thing is, is that we are in this new phase where uh, it doesn't matter whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's the Republicans or whether it is uh, the Azeris and Turks, but they are openly saying what they're going to do. And people go, I don't think that's right. They're not really, they're not really going to do that. And yet they do it. And yet right. nobody holds them accountable for it. And no one pushes back. Right. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, you know, they, they have said openly that Yerevan is theirs and they're going to act like every inch of, right. of ground is theirs and they're going to behave in a way that is, uh, that is going to keep pushing us until they get it. And that is, you know, I, I just, you know, it is infuriating to me that the international community is so impotent to do anything about it. You know, up until about nine hours ago, nobody in this country was talking about Afghanistan. And now everybody in their sister-in-law is talking about Afghanistan. Sure. But you had, you had a couple hundred, you had, what, 150,000 people displaced out of, out of Ar- Artsakh and, and crickets. Nobody said shit. And that's just ridiculous. And I don't mean to curse, but it just, it, it, you know, I think we're at the, we're at the point of um, this being more than uh, there's something going on that I, that I, the yeah, I mean, Rich, radio we, silence is just, well, well, we've talked about it like a lot, a lot, right? It, the geopolitics, geopolitics of the region uh, just really uh, have a muscle, a muzzle on things, but you know, that's why we're doing this, right? People need to know what's going on. Just real real quick, the two prisoners that were returned, the Armenian prisoners that were returned are Arthur Nalbanyan and Aramas Tarozian. They happen to be the two the two same soldiers who disappeared at Black Lake or Sevlich in the Sunik region of Armenia at dawn on July 14 of this year. So remember, we've been talking a lot, you know, before we were on hiatus for a little bit, we were talking often about how there were a thousand Azeri soldiers on Armenian land, how they were uh, trying to take Black Lake, how uh, right. two soldiers were lost. Here they are, they've been returned. Jamil Badayev is the, uh, the Azeri soldier who invaded the Armenian home last month in Martakert and threatened two minors who were home. Yeah, well, you know, the other thing that, that needs to be talked so, about uh, you know, let's let's keep it moving on the POWs, but yeah, you know, uh, it's it's just awful, man. Um, the other thing that we should probably talk about uh, is, you know, is I mean, it's a good thing that they've been returned, but it's also important to remember uh, what is likely to have happened to them while they were gone. Uh, you know, we've got a situation where it's not like they're being held and they're given coffee every few hours. I mean, the, these 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 men and you know are being held uh, as prisoners of war in a very, you know, barbaric way. Um, yeah. So this is Armand Tatoyan, the uh, ombudsman for Armenia. He is actually the most favored, at least according to a poll during the election time, the most favored politician, if you will, of Armenia. And rightfully so. This man is nonstop. And actually, he's prepared a report, public report about the Azeri acts of torture against the Armenian POWs. We're going to share the link. It is extremely detailed and it's extremely graphic information that is shared. So it's just very, very strong trigger warning for anybody that actually reads the report. I've bookmarked it. I plan to go through it at some point, but this is very, very traumatic things that are happening. But this man has done amazing work recording it and making this public report that he is going out and sharing with the international community that you you mentioned, Rich, which we have seen just completely unacceptably inactive this entire time uh, and continues to be, it feels. Um, so, but we're grateful for the work he is doing, he is doing and, and for preparing this report. And we're going to share it and make it available with everybody. Yeah, it's, it's up on the feed already. And I have to say, you know, this is unprecedented. Like, I, maybe it is an unprecedented, but it certainly is a big deal. Uh, you know the fact that uh, an official document like this has been is 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 being distributed and right. able to be distributed uh, is a big deal because 
you know, usually these things get uh, maybe handed out at a UN meeting and nobody else sees it or nobody else hears about it. Uh, yeah. So know. just one thing to keep in mind, Rich, uh, you're right. Like it, they, it should be more visible. I, I commend Osparets for including this link on their on their article. Uh, our Montatoyan's predecessor, excuse me, uh, are the uh, Artsakh um, prior ombudsman, Artak Beglarian also produced one during the war about the uh, the war crimes and about torture. Uh, this is one that's it seems to be just very very comprehensive as well from the Armenian ombudsman. The one thing of note, and this is again trigger warning. Uh, I'm going to say it's a trigger warning. It may not be to everybody, but according to the report, Rich, a very special force has reserved the most cruel treatment toward veterans of the Karabakh Liberation War in the 1990s, the war that we won in 1991 through 94, and the April 2016 four-day war, which was which just preceded the founding of this very podcast, Arach Media. So. Um, it's interesting. I mean, that's it's uh, disturbing to hear that. Um, so, but it's important to know. Well, I mean, you know, we, you know, there shouldn't be any mistake who who our enemy is in the way that they treat us, and and right. and so, you know, you, you you don't necessarily negotiate with a rabid dog. You you contain it, and then you try and get it back to health. And if you can't, um, well, then there are consequences. And I I just I you know I don't I I don't. I don't know that I'm trying to draw any like de definite parallel other than to say that the, 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 the enemy that we are dealing with has been continually provoking uh, and is backed by people who have a history of continually provoking, as we all know, because we're all the descendants of it. So, you know. Um, yeah, Turkey, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, and so the other part of this is that, you know, now, you know, we, we, we are getting a little bit of international pull perhaps not as much as uh, we'd like, but, you know, while Yerevan is, is, is blasting Baku, um, you know, Moscow is trying to call on Azerbaijan also to return the POWs. Um, right. but, you know, the, but the reality, and I, I just, I hope that this is going to get some traction. I hope that they're going to listen, but I, I just, until I see plane loads of men coming back and a, and a full disclosure, it's going to be really hard for me to, 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 to see this as another, as anything else other than just more circular discussion. Right, right. It feels that way, right? I mean, remember what, over the summer, earlier in the summer and late fall, we were seeing 15 POWs at a time, of course, in exchange for completely disproportionate mine maps, minefield maps right. of the territories of Artsakh that we lost and things like that. But it is, to your point, important to see that these discussions are happening, but we need, we, there needs to be much more rapid action. And this whole diplomacy, there is no diplomacy here, uh, but we even see in our own country, right, Rich? In our own state, even, uh, politics are a very long game, but POWs should not be pawns or political pawns. That in itself is a war crime and it needs to stop. But you see here, Armenia's new foreign minister, Ararat Mizoyan, you know, uh, right before we we were on hiatus, we talked often about how the prior foreign minister who had just taken over in November, Ara Ivazian, had stepped down prior to the election. There's a new foreign minister, Ararat Mizoyan. He met on right. The he met with Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia. And uh, he said that Aliyev's assertions that Armenians are currently being held in Azerbaijan were captured after the November, November 9 agreement. Uh, he, sorry, man, I'm rambling. He denounced the holding of the POWs and promised Russia's active involvement in getting them back. So well, I certainly uh, hope so. I mean, you know, the good news is, is that we've got you know, Russia's got a new commander uh, of their peacekeeping, uh, you know, contingent. Yes. And that's super important. I, I, and, you know, to, to, and I want to make sure everybody sees this, um, you know, but to, to, to remind everybody, you know, of course, you know, we're, you know, diplomacy is, is, 
the, the problem is, is that while we want diplomacy and we want to work things out, we want a long-term solution, the acts of aggression that are happening are, are happening faster than the negotiations can squash it. And that's a problem because exactly. people are dying and people are being displaced and the stresses, and this is deliberate. This is being orchestrated. So it's not like just some accidental issue. 100% deliberate, 100% deliberate. Uh, so yes, a new commander just took over. So it's interesting because I believe it's been, it's been less than a year since the peacekeeping forces came in, right? Right after November 9. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how, how often they're replacing their commanders of the forces, how often are the forces, the, the soldiers themselves being uh, switched out, right? I guess this is like a new base for them, just like U.S. has bases all over the world. Russia has these bases. And, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to, to monitor this. Also in conjunction with this or around the same time, there were uh, military leaders there were military training that there was military strategic military exercises that took place also and Armenian soldiers participated as well in those drills uh, with contingents from Russia, Belarus, India, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Mongolia. So uh, Armenian soldiers were participating in that um, as well. So. Well, I mean. Happening yeah. around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can touch on a few things quickly, man. Uh, happening, what's happening in Armenia, and then perhaps we could touch on uh, uh, the like the upcoming film screening that you mentioned as well at the top. Um, yeah. So yeah. this this next story, and this is you know th th this I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, uh, only because it's so aggravating. Um, and I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. not put on my Greg hat because I just I'm just this just lights me up. Um, I know there. Listen, I I think that yeah, many this... of us have tried to not be, you know, anti Pashinyan. Um, and again, I've said this multiple times. But the problem is, where there's smoke, there's often fire. And here's a guy who is saying, you know, we're ready to talk about normalizing Armenia-Turkey relations and relaunching uh, these railways and roads. Um, to what right. end? So that now we can have Turks and Azeris just driving through the area, like to what? What are we talking about this for? Like, what what is this man doing? And right. I, 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 I openly challenge any Pashinian apologist to come and sit at the table and say why this is a good thing with no preconditions. Why is this okay? What, well, I mean, now here's the thing. Here's the thing, Rich. And now look, Pashinian in the past, I'm not defending the man, but in the past he has said normalization without precondition. So hopefully that's still his MO, right? But... To your point, what is really bizarre and concerning at the same time is how can we be buying into the, what's the terminology I'm looking for, Rich? Is it bait and switch? Is it deflect, not deflection, is it distraction? You know, Turkey is fully backing Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is completely showing and, and taking on acts of aggression how can we normalize relations when we are still at war with azerbaijan that is backed by turkey right how can we normalize relations now look trying to think what could be the devil's advocate view on this what could be the opposite view on this right now and the only thing that i could think of rich and i'm curious what you think of it we could spend multiple episodes on this right is solely for the attempt at economic advantages or improvement, solely. But how can you do that with, with people that want you gone and you're still at war with, right? Well, it's, you know, it is, well, first of all, you're right. We could spend an entire episode on it. And I, and many episodes the time. Right. Um, but I've said it before, without a truth and reconciliation commission, without being completely transparent, honest, and without really atoning for the crimes that have been committed. And continue to be committed. And continue to be committed. That's right. With, that with are active. Backing. This is with, active. This isn't the, like, yeah. The full military backing of, the, of Turkey for Azerbaijan, the full military, they just did military exercises on Monday, right? 
By the way, this news just came out yesterday. And Rich, the first person I thought of was our best friend, one of our best friends. You cut out. Really, I'm going to cuss right now. I was uh, like. Hold on, rewind. Gonna... Can you say it again? Because you cut out yeah. for a second. Well, no one problem. of my best friends, and then you vanished. Greg Nemet, Greg Nemet, co founder of Adach Media, co fellow co host. I thought of him right away because he's been talking about it for weeks, months, that this is what Pushinian was trying to do. And I'm like, dude, I'm not seeing that. Where are you seeing that? He was seeing it on Clubhouse app, the audio conversation yep. app, right? He was seeing it there. Now it's hitting the media directly and Pushinian is talking about it. It just doesn't seem to make sense at this time when Turkey is backing Azerbaijan 100% and Azerbaijan is trying to kill Armenians still. So, well, you know, you know, the, the, the thing that comes up for me about all this, and this is just sort of not to deflect, but to really sort of go about this a different way. Um, you know, when Obama became president, one of the things he tried to do was to bring some of his rivals in. He wanted to be like uh, a little bit more like, um, uh, you know, Lincoln and yeah. bring in, bring in his rivals and, and sort of rivals. have, have have different negotiations and have a different sort of leveling of the playing field. Uh, the problem is that the Republicans didn't want any of that. They just right. they wanted to get the black man out of the office and they wanted to block him from it from doing anything. And that's just the way it was. Um, and I will argue with anybody who tells me any different because that's that's exactly what happened. Uh, and right. and and so what I'm saying is is that I think. Best case scenario, the best case scenario is that Pashinian really wants to do the right thing as he sees it and squash the violence and put this to rest because we need to get economic development happening. I understand that. But the worst case scenario is that he's in on the heist. And somewhere in between may be the truth. And I don't know what that is. Right. You know, because what's happening doesn't seem like the way to create lasting peace if you don't come to terms with what's happened. Right. You know, the, 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 the Turks will wholeheartedly refuse to discuss, and they have murdered people who have tried to discuss any talk of the Armenian genocide as an actual event. And so to think that they're going to come to the table now is laughable at best. Keep in mind that we are only talking about the last vestiges of what is left of Armenia. We're talking about parts of what's known as Eastern Armenia. We're not talking about the Armenian Highland. We're not talking about Western Armenia. We're not talking about any of that stuff. We're trying to desperately hold on to this little, tiny little, uh, you know, landlocked area that doesn't even have Ararat in it. So we're in a situation where we have a president who... Some may think he's got the best intentions, and some may think he has nefarious intentions. And the problem is, is many of us can't figure out what the truth is amidst all of that. And I, and I would like to, I'd like to know more. Right. You know, I don't his, know the man's heart, but I see the man's actions, and it doesn't line up right. Right. Well, his quote, part of his quote in his comments uh, to his to the parliament was that he said. By and large, this is about transforming our region into a crossroads linking the West with the East and North with the South. Yes, Armenia used to be right in the middle of the Silk Road. The problem is you have two neighbors on the East and the West that are actively, you're actively at war with. Whether he realizes that or not, that's a whole nother discussion, but it's just the timing doesn't make sense as there's, and look, I, Rich, I know you and I and Greg too, we want economic prosperity for Armenia. It's, it's a must. Who wouldn't? Right. It just, like you to your last point, man, it does not sit right. And I cannot think of the terminology of what Erdogan is doing. Erdogan just said days ago, they were ready to normalize relations. What is that called? He is, it's not gaslighting. It's, well, he's probably lying, but there's another terminology for it. I can't think of it. Maybe we'll get to it later, but whatever. 
Pashinyan appears to be playing into it, which doesn't make sense. Well, listen, it's yeah. the same thing that, that listen, this is a this is a common playbook nowadays, David. We right. have to we have to really I, I just would like us to really just and I think our listeners need to accept this too. We live in a new age where our leadership, quote unquote, the people who have the figurehead position. These people are telling us blatant lies in front of our face that we can see, that we can hear, that we can, <clears throat> that we can tangibly understand. And they're doing the complete opposite. I'll give you an example. Right now, the Taliban has taken over Afghanistan. And they've changed the name, what, to the, the caliphate, blah, 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 blah. And, and what do they do? They say, oh, yeah, we're going to, don't worry about it. We're going to treat women just fine. But don't come out of your homes. Yeah. You know, so they're liars. They're liars. And I think that, that even if we could give Pashinian credit for doing his best and trying his best and having his heart in the right place, which I can't confirm. The actions don't line up with the, the, the you know, any sort of true long-term reconciliation. These people are actively on the hunt for us. Actively. It's not going to stop. Yeah. And we no, need our, outside our, intervention. Our, yeah, and to yeah. be honest with you, we need more than the Russians. Yeah, I mean, because here's the thing, the Russians... France and the U.S., as stated in that Armenian report report that we that we just shared, and I'm, is on the feed, I'm sure, or will be the. They're all in favor of this normalization. So what happens faster, Rich? And look, I'm now I'm taking us on a tangent. We, we'll talk about this for months and months. Hopefully not, though. What happens faster? The return of POWs or the normalization of relations with Turkey and then the opening of all the borders and everything. What happens faster? So like, I don't know, because if you have- the Can, US, you, imagine, can yeah. you imagine being a, a, an Armenian vendor in, in Yerevan or anywhere? Yeah. Or, 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 you know, who maybe you're a refugee from Artsakh who's now, you know, you, by the way, they can't find apartments now. By the way, the money's running out. By the way, the winter's going to be coming again. By the way, they, you know, they're, they're, there's, there's thousands of refugees. There's people who are fleeing the homeland in record numbers because of this. Right. And so, you know, and, and then the Turks and Azeris know it. They're like, tick tock, we're going to take it all anyway. You know what I mean? So they don't care. They don't care because, they, because, because Baku can hold, uh, you know, a Formula One race track there. They right. can, they, and, they, right. and, no, and nobody cares. The miles away, like literally within walking distance uh, to where POWs are being tortured and they're having, you know, you know, uh, damn near a fashion show. It's 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 absurd. And and, and so there are there are two things I would say. And then I, I really want to ditch this topic because it's yes. not going to go anywhere. Uh, this is the product of 30 years of not doing enough to bolster our homeland. This is the product of 30 years of 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 administration after administration siphoning the money away from the people this is a, this is a product of 30 years of not arming ourselves to the effing teeth this is a, the product of three decades of inactivity and thinking that teaching our kids chess and and developing a, a, a you know a, an internet sector is going to be the savior of the day it doesn't it, the truth is is that we have a, a, a kid who's under 30 who flew on his own money to go bring to go bring chainsaws to to villages so that they could survive. And you're gonna tell me that that we couldn't do anything in the past 30 years? Like it's unbelievable that it's come to this. It is just unbelievable. And it is heartbreaking and frustrating because um, I know you and I have grown up in a comparatively privileged environment and and our hearts and our minds are focused on um doing the best for this nation and i am just livid that we are even talking about any concessions with people who actively are trying to murder us and who are actively trying to provoke people in david it's happening it happened at kzv it it, it could very well happen here in sacramento 
I drive around with an Armenian flag on the back of my car, and people every once in a while, hey, is that the Armenian flag? Absolutely, yes, it is. Would you like to know more? You know what I mean? And Amen. and and that's what we got to do. But the fact that it's come to this, and we're talking about normalizing relations as a as a way of mitigating the damage that the same people have done to us, is absurd. It's absolutely yeah. absurd. And there's no conscionable way to have to 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 to, to justify it. None whatsoever. Yeah. None whatsoever. The, the the timing doesn't make any sense. And um, as and and to further add insult to injury, to act to, to this parlays into the next subject, which is that the I, you know, like I said, I don't know the man's heart, so I can't with certainty verify what's going on. But I can tell you that he seems very very out of touch, as evidenced by this latest uh, you know situation here. We've got grief stricken Armenians who are resenting the idea that the government is planning this lavish celebration. David, do you have anything to say about this? Yeah, yeah. One thing I, I want to share. I thought it was interesting that as I to tune this this source is the one breaking this. Osborne has had it. You know, I'll sh we'll say it live right here. Osborne has tends to lean anti pashinyan Osprey has leans ARF. ARF was Kocharian, but they've been anti pashinyan throughout. Yet Osprey has had it, and Radio Free Europe, Azad Uchun, had it, which you could argue, hmm, is it, it it's funded by the US? Could it be pro pashinyan I thought it was interesting that they had that story. Um, and it is concerning, and I think we have to. Yes, Armenia's independence is important. It's coming up September 21. Also, just quickly mention, we won't have to necessarily get into a whole story on it in a moment, but September 2nd was Artsakh's independence as well. It was marking 30 years of Artsakh's independence, 1991, September 2, 1991. And uh, sure, we've lost 80% of the territory, but Artsakh is still a territory and there's still Armenians living there. Yes. It's, also, it's also important to know, and I'm just going to say this for all of our uh, Republican-loving Armenians. First of all, there's two things for me to say. Uh, I want to get this out of the way. Uh, that we really try to be agnostic when it comes to our sources and our leanings. I don't care if it's left-leaning or right-leaning or center. I just want to know more information so we can disseminate it and we can figure it out and we can have realistic discussions about it. Um, so that said, as far as my own political leanings go, um, I try and keep that out of whatever we're talk talking about here. Um, I, I like to, I think I'm a centrist, not because um, I don't want to choose a side, but because I like to call bullshit on whoever deserves it. Um, and that's just my way of doing it. That said, I would, I just want to say to all those Republican Armenians, uh, while I respect you, and e even if you are all about uh, President Reagan, because he was the one who said, genocide in the midst of, in context of the Armenians, even though he didn't call it a genocide and all that. Um, you know, people give him a lot of credit for ending the ending the Cold War, or theoretically ending the Cold War. It never really ended. Um, the reality is, is that it was Artsakh and Armenia breaking away from the Soviet Union that helped really create the big fissures and the big fractures. So the fact that Artsakh celebrated its independence and, and then we're assumed to, to uh, celebrate Armenia itself uh, celebrating its independence. This is a big deal, and we should all be proud as Armenians, regardless of our political leanings. Yeah, you know, look, one thing I'll mention just to give both sides, Rich. Uh, you know, look, I 100%, I'm going to side with the families. These are the families of the Armenian soldiers that were killed in last year's war with Azerbaijan that have expressed the outrage at planned, large scale, and colorful Independence Day celebrations as. Uh, promised by uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. Now, his quote is, this will be the first and foremost, this will be first and foremost dedicated to our martyrs who sacrificed their lives for Armenia's independence, security, and sovereignty. He said that during a cabinet meeting. So he said that, but the public reaction doesn't seem to be siding with that. Uh, be, now, just we're going to touch on these numbers again. According to official figures, about 3,800 Armenian soldiers were killed in the war. That's the official more, report. Yes, and more exactly official reports, and more than. But that's 200, not accurate. 
right? It's, anyway. probably, it's probably more than it's probably more than four thousand, right? And more than two hundred others went missing or were taken prisoner during the hostilities. And also, it's important to know this is trigger warning. Search teams are still recovering bodies on a virtually daily basis. I think there was one yesterday. Soldiers' remains uh, from the former battlefields that are now controlled by Azeri forces. So it's still a very somber. Well, you know, we situation. we and 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 we know how well they're going to take care of our dead. Well, right. No, no, no. I think these are being recovered by ICRC, by our by our people, and so on. Right. Like I think that's officially being recovered. Uh, I can't, I can't really comment on more than that, but um, yes, I mean, of course they. Yeah. Well. Properly. Um, right. But anyway, I'm curious, you know, I'd actually want to put this out. The, the people that we have watching still, we'd like to know your thoughts. We're not, we are not just about bashing Pashinyan and bashing the current administration. No. We want to know, I want to know our viewers' thoughts. What are your thoughts on Pashinyan calling for normalizing relations that Armenia is ready to do that normalizing relations with Turkey and what are your thoughts on a colorful celebration for Independence Day on September 21 given the reaction from the families of fallen soldiers I'd like to know what people's thoughts are uh, but yeah and meanwhile uh, while we while we wait to see if uh, you know you know how many people uh, are going to chime in and ara oh did I okay. anyway um yeah 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 <laughs> Uh, either, either live or later too. But yeah, let's let's yeah, for sure. here. Um, did you want to talk about the reservists? Yeah, let's just quickly mention it. I saw this come across uh, while we were on hiatus. The Armen Armenia, the Ministry of Defense of Armenia, has react has activated reservists. Not sure how many, uh, but I think that that's very interesting. It does directly coincide with the acts of aggression that we're seeing on the border regions of Armenia, and on what we're seeing in in, uh, in Artsakh. So uh, I don't know your thoughts, Rich, but that does not seem like coincidence to me. No, I don't Reserve, think it's, I don't think it's, yeah. Reservists have been, it's, sorry, go ahead, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go I don't ahead. think it's coincidence. Um, and I, I said this during the war and I will continue to believe this, that it's, it's um, you know, don't, don't ever underestimate the power of people trying to protect their homes. Um, you know, one good Armenian soldier is is worth at least a half a dozen of them. Absolutely. But, but the problem, the other, the, the the you know, the the flip side of that is that you know, when you have when you have reports of old equipment, when you have reports of not good training, when you have reports right. of you know chaos and lack of leadership, um, or at least challenges in leadership. Let's leave it at that. Right. Um, you know, will alone won't do it. You know, you, I, I know in my life, um, as an, as a person that has been in a sales environment, has been an operations environment, um, a good ops person can easily out, outdo a salesperson because they know what they're doing. Um, a salesperson who knows how to sell is fantastic, but they're hamstrung if they don't have any good processes. And what I'm saying is, is that, you know, the best armies in the world don't necessarily have the best fighters. They have the best organization and they have good equipment. Yeah. I mean, I can remember, this is, this is a little 10, 10, 10, 10 second story. This gives you a window into the Armenian mind. Okay. I remember when I first told my father about system of a down, cause I 30 plus years as a musician and I'm telling my father, Oh my God, there's this Armenian rock band. They're like heavy metal and they're coming up and they're, 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 you know, they're touring the world. It's, they're becoming, you know, a, a huge thing. And his first thing after watching the, you know, seeing the videos besides like, oh my gosh, it's not his genre. But the first thing he said was, do, do, do they have good equipment? And I was like, yeah, yeah, dad, they have good equipment. Of course they do. But it, it gives you an idea that our means are used to having crappy stuff. And that's. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the, a way other, to save a country, man. That's you, all I'm saying. You're you're absolutely right, Rich. The other thing that has really changed the situation dramatically and made it even more difficult is Azerbaijan, Tur excuse me, Turkey's complete backing of Azerbaijan. 1991 through 94, we won with 
literal diaspora going there, literal people taking up whatever arms they could get and and the sheer will, right? We won that because it was Armenian will versus just the piddly Azeri army. I'm going to say it. And any Azeris out there, come from, please, uh, I'll welcome it. But the piddly, the, the pitiful Azeri army is backed by the second largest NATO army right now in Turkey. And so that changes the whole game. So you're absolutely right. Uh, 100%. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. 100%. So, but with, with that said, reservists have been activated and they have now uh, three month training is going to begin on September 15 in just a few days. So right. um, that's what's happening there. And it just obviously there does not seem to be a de-escalation of aggression right now. Right. Um, so um, let's you know, get let's yeah. get to um, Let's get to oh boy, I don't know what happened to these these links. Give me one second here. No, no problem. While you're pulling that up, you know, we'll put the rapid fire thing since we've been gone. We'll put it in the feed. Rich, you probably maybe have already have done it. We've already touched on the, the provocations and aggressions that have been continuing and they've been happening since we were last on. They're still happening. Artsakh's 30-year independence day was on, on September 2nd. And it's important to note, and our friend Ara and top fan Ara. Uh, Rich, thank you for having him become one of our top fans through your connection. Uh, and we're grateful to have him. He was a past guest as well. He pointed this out to us before it's been reported now that Armenia's top leadership did not attend Artsakh's Independence Day events for the first time in 30 years since uh, Artsakh's independence in 91. Don't know why. Uh, well, I can, we can, we can. We can we can speculate as to why it may not be accurate, but you know, I mean, my my take is they don't want to remind yeah, I don't people know. about. I'd like stuff. to hear. I think that they, I think that the Armenian leadership right now is considering Artsakh its back forty, and they don't care about it anymore. They want it to be a dealt with situation. But Bashinian said that when he before he got elected, he that he doesn't you know he didn't care about it. Right, Artsakh's a problem. Yeah, it, it, it could be. It could be. Uh, but I mean. I don't know, man. I'd like to hear from the administration. I'd like to know why, 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 for the why for the first time in thirty years, the 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 status of Artsakh has not been resolved. Okay, it's not a Russian territory. It's not an Azeri territory as much as they would like to say, as much as they will say that is an Armenian territory. Armenians still live on that. We are still going to fight for, or should be fighting for. Right? We lost yeah, but- eighty percent of it. But why were you not there? I'd like to know. I'd like to know. Anyone viewing, what are your thoughts? Why did they not? Why did uh, Pushinya not send anybody? Why did he himself not go? Because well, it would be offensive? It would be offensive if they went because he signed the November 9th? What is it? Well, okay. So I, I, before we pivot to, to uh, Emil Gisson and the, and, and, and the movie, I do want to just put something in context. We just airlifted what? The United States just airlifted what? 120, 150,000 uh, Afghanis out of Afghanistan. An unprecedented number of C-17 flights flying in and out, in and out. Every 45 minutes, they're loading up these. If you've never seen a C-17, it's incredibly impressive. They are enormous machines. I mean, enormous machines. The kinds of machines that you could put tanks in, right? They are, they're, they're unbelievable flying craft. And they're packing them full of people. And they're, this is the United States Air Force has been doing an exemplary job, uh, as is everybody who was there. Where were they flying these people to? Do you know what countries were supporting them? That effort? Qatar and Turkey. They were supporting the relief efforts. So do you think that America is really going to go to Turkey and say, hey, you guys need to go and lay off of this little country that we don't even care about. Are you? Oh, there's, there's, there should be no Armenian alive who believes that America is going to do anything. Rich, again, and I wish it wasn't that way, but it is that way. Rich, it's geopolitics and NATO, right? Geopolitics and NATO. There it is. Right. So yeah. So when we I, talk I, about that, we'll keep talking about it. Yeah. I feel like I put on my Greg hat today because he's not here. Thanks, Greg. You're you're you've you've. Uh, You've uh, infected me with your whatever. With your, so. <laughs> yeah, 
It's all right, man. It's, it's the right. truth, uh, man. It's the truth. It's the sad, terrible truth. Um, that said, let's talk about uh, a, a former guest of ours, uh, Mr. Emil Giesen, yes. who's, uh who put together uh, what I can assume is an, uh, is an amazing film. He's going to be having a, um, a screening of it in San Francisco on September the 22nd. Um, yep. It's going to be at the Palace of Fine Arts, a very large theater uh, and so make sure to go on, get your tickets there, everyone here in the Bay Area. He is doing a screening on September 16, there it is, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, that is at the famous Chinese Theater. I don't think it's any longer called the Man's Chinese Theater, but it is the Chinese Theater, famous Chinese Theater. It's pretty amazing. He got that. Shout out to his team. Um, you know, we're going to be working with uh, our friend Jivan Gasparian as well. Uh, in due time uh, to get him out here as best we can and or do something digital. Uh, but we'll, this will be news on that coming out. But shout out to Emil Giesen, our prior guest. You know, we heard from him directly the work he put in and the story he was trying to tell. Right. He said this is a human story um, and he wanted to make sure it was a human story so that it was not just for an Armenian audience. It's not just for an Armenian audience around the world this is going to really be for everybody to see and so uh, i think it's important for us to support him right. uh you know there's been some confusion and some concern about statements he's made on podcasts and on social media and here and there i would just encourage people to really try to think critically uh really do your own investigation perhaps engage with him directly he does he does respond to uh you know don't go out and accuse him of stuff maybe ask him i actually spoke with him directly um, and uh, he clarified, you know, he clarified, he put a post out clarifying some of his statements about the status of Artsakh and so on. So I want sure, I want people to try not to be uh, too quick to judge, um, you know, no one's perfect. And well, I don't I yeah, think I, yeah. I, I, I know what you're saying, David, yeah. and I, I don't think that we need to syrup it up too much for, for people. I only yeah. I, I say that I, I say that with all due respect to you, I'm just saying that yes. I think you know our audience is is pretty savvy enough to 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 to, to sort through it. I think I, I I think that that um yeah I think that's about as much as we need to say about no, about right. his about you're his right. comments uh, right. because you know he's he's like anybody else who's trying to put put together um, some some content. I mean, how many other people have made a film like this about this? So I think right. it's 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 important to. To, to go into it with as open as eyes as possible. And, I, you know, I have spent my life being pretty hyper-emotional. But there are situations when we need to, you know, reel that back in a little bit and try and look objectively. Um, I don't, again, I've said this about Pashini and I'll say it about Giesen. I don't know the man's heart, so I can't really judge him. Um, I can only judge what he's doing and see see what it, you know, how it, how it comes off. And hopefully, hopefully this movie is a... Um, a, a telling of the story in the right way. I don't even know what the right way is, but other than to say that I believe that the Armenians have the high ground uh, intellectually and, uh, and morally and ethically, um, I think that's important. I think that's really important. Um, and I would also say this, um, for those of us Armenians who, you know, when, when, when David, when you talk about him making this for a non-Armenian audience, that's super important because I don't know about anybody else, but I have spent years and years and years contributing to other communities because I know we're going to need allies and I can't go through life alone. Life is 100% a team sport. It absolutely is a team sport. Yeah. I mean, each of us have got someone to draw on, whether it's our parents, our siblings, our friends, our you know extended family, someone that we can be in some sort of you know relation with. And and our community, as isolationist as we can be, as gregarious as we can be if you can break through that, as outgoing as we can be for each other, we need to do that with other people too. Because the Emil Giesens of the world may be a hit or miss with some people, but he's telling a story about us. And he's telling a story that people need to know about. And, and so the only way that's going to happen more often is if we engage with other communities. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. Um, I, I, because, because in order to, to have allies, you need to be an ally. 
that's about all I got to say about that. No, well, well said, Rich. Well said. Thank you, man. And I just want to encourage people to, in that sentiment, to if you can go to this event, wear a mask, uh, bring a yeah. friend, bring a friend, Armenian friend, non-Armenian friend, bring bring a friend to see this film. Uh, and uh, it's important. It's important that we get it out there and so on so okay we have a couple more amazing stories to talk about which are really cool i've been seeing uh, a friend of the show matthew karanian who, uh, who who had that fantastic book about uh, historic armenia and the highland um he was actually at this uh this this mass uh some time ago um and now they're having it you know the the the, the mass uh you know you, david maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah yeah no they, they just held the annual mass at the holy cross church in Akhtamar. that's Akhtamar island uh famed famous uh mythology uh, surrounding that island armenian mythology but uh this is it's on it's on lake vaughn in turkey uh, my family hails from the lake vaughn region my father's side, but the annual mass was held there. So this is positive news, right? A couple positive things we can share that that. Uh, hey, what's that? I think you cut out there for a second, but okay. Sorry, sorry, internet might be weak. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, man? I, I can now. Yeah, it, the annual mass was held on Akhtamar Island in Lake Vaughan, which is in Turkey the very famed Akhtamar Island. So uh, that's one positive thing we can share. Uh, I think the other one we can share is from the world of sports. Right, Rich? Uh, yeah, for sure. I just want to, I want to, I want to show, for those of you who don't know this image, uh, this is Akhtamar. Yes. This is, this is the church on the island in Lake, in Lake Vaughan. Yes. Now, beautiful. I can't imagine anybody looking at me with a straight face and telling me the, that Armenians have not been, you know, you know, committed to their faith for more than 1,500 years, 1,700 years. We've been doing beautiful work for centuries. Um, I just, I feel so fortunate. Um, so you were saying about the World Cup qualifier. Yeah, Arme Armenia is doing, this just continues to, uh, to impress and improve. I'm not sure what their FIFA ranking is yet. They were 90 which is amazing, right? Out of all the nations out there in the world. Uh, and they just won uh, yesterday, uh, not, well, excuse me, they drew, they had a draw with Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein, am I saying Lichten it right? How do you say it? No, nope. Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein, thank you, Rich. Forgive my ignorance there, but they sure. drew, they had a draw with Lichten Liechtenstein, a one-to-one -one in World Cup qualifiers. Greg could go into a lot more detail on this in terms of how the scoring works, but a draw, I would imagine, is better for points than a loss. So, uh, Armenia, who knows? We have to keep a close eye on this. It'd be amazing okay. to see Armenia in the World Cup in 2022. That I think that's good. really awesome. I just, I, I will, I will say this until I, until I can't anymore, <laughs> is that I still hold a little bit of not, not a grudge or, or anything, but just I'm a little bit bummed that they never called me back when I wanted to be their goalie when I could have been. I can't now, so you missed out, guys. Sorry, oh, just let wow, you know. Wow, wow, man! <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> because, because there's something there's, you know what? As as driven as I think I am, and I like to be, uh, there is something really satisfying about preventing someone else from making a goal rather than scoring one yourself. <laughs> Especially when it, you know, but <laughs> in soccer more than anything else. But at any rate, um, yeah. yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, the next thing that we should probably do is just wrap and um, yeah. let everybody know <laughs> that probably. there are some links that we have on what we are calling our link tree and our link tree. Uh, David spent a lot of time putting this together. So if you have a chance, download it or at least click onto it, because what it'll do is it'll give you um, access to a whole bunch of other links. This is like the, 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 this is the Lord of the Lord of the Rings for links. Uh, it's the it's the it's the link to rule them all. This is the one where you know you'll have the opportunity to uh, you know either get into the the social thing with uh, the links for Javon or for Milgisen or if you want to do political advocacy. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can, can contribute, and that is on our link tree, and I'll put that in the feed right now. David, did you want to talk at all about uh, our upcoming schedule? 
Sure. I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, whether we'll, we'll maintain weekly or, or switch to bi-weekly uh, or, every, or twice a month. Uh, I think um, just keep a lookout on the, the Facebook and Instagram feed information, information on that. We're going to keep the guests coming as often as possible. Got some great ones in the queue or in the lineup in the works. Uh, so just be on the lookout uh, for upcoming episodes. And we look forward to welcoming, welcoming Greg back as well when he's done with the, the harvest time of wine. So and, uh, and, and remember that some fantastic cutting wines will be coming out of this. Uh, his efforts do not go unnoticed or unappreciated. Um, miss you. And, um, you know, yeah. so we can't wait to get him back. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty good. So, you know. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Rich. Thank, Thank you, you David. Yeah. And uh, thanks everyone for watching, tuning in. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.